Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this launch of a new ISS strategic dossier on North Korean security challenges. A net assessment like our other strategic dossiers, it has the most refined technical analysis of problems that you could discover in the public domain, but it also embeds the challenges of North Korean weapons programs in a wider strategic uh, context. And I'd like to invite uh, Mark Fitzpatrick, our director for uh, non-proliferation principal, author, editor, and compiler of this really very comprehensive study to uh, make some formal comments from uh, this podium, and then uh, he will answer any and all of your questions. The security challenges posed by North Korea are formidable. They include nearly the full array of weapons of mass destruction. Plutonium-based nuclear weapons program, now supplemented by uranium enrichment. The world's third largest chemical weapons arsenal, possibly biological weapons, and the range of ballistic missiles that may be able to deliver these weapons to South Korea and Japan. The threat from these weapons is not just direct. North Korea has threatened to transfer nuclear weapons technology, as indeed it already has, along with missiles and other arms. North Korea's lethal attacks last year on a South Korean warship and a populated island were vivid reminders of the conventional military threat and the potential for resumed conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Although unable to feed its people, North Korea remains highly armed, determined to seize advantage through asymmetric capabilities, and ready to fire first. North Korea remains the most militarized country on Earth, with the world's fourth largest army and the biggest special forces. Although the North's economic decline and the South's enhanced capabilities make invasion scenarios less credible today than they were in the past, Pyongyang has many ways to inflict harm without invading. Electronic warfare is among the other forms of asymmetric capabilities that make Seoul feel vulnerable. Meanwhile, North Korea has engaged in diverse forms of state-sponsored crime, including the kidnapping of foreign nationals, trafficking in narcotics and many other forms of contraband, and the counterfeiting of foreign currency. This criminality and the refugee flows, human trafficking, and other complications arising from the regime's mistreatment of its own people pose additional security challenges for North Korea's neighbors and the wider international community. It's a moot point whether the Kim regime is more of a menace to its own subjects or the wider world. Its provocative behavior increases the risk that eventually somebody, whether in, within or outside, will be goaded to retaliate. The threats that North Korea presents to the outside world are inextricably linked to its domestic situation. Without foreign assistance and a structural overhaul, the North has no realistic prospect of sustainable development. With political control and regime protection, its overriding concerns, however, the regime has been unwilling to undertake the bold structural reforms and transparency measures necessary to resuscitate the economy or to give up its nuclear weapons program in exchange for the foreign assistance and trade that, would, that could rescue the nation from its poverty. Instead, Kim Jong-il has turned to the armed forces, designating a, quote, military first policy as the regime's guiding ideology. The collapse of the public distribution system in the mid-1990s, the growth of private markets, and increased knowledge of the outside world have led North Korean society to start fracturing. A traditional communist class structure based on political standards is changing to one determined by income. And as more North Koreans become involved in market activities, the greater <coughs> the income disparities that emerge. The magnitude and pace of social change in North Korea is often overestimated, but the direction of it is indisputable. The dynastic succession now beginning to unfold in Pyongyang and the uncertainties this entails exacerbate the potential for conflict. 
last year's sudden acceleration of the transition of power is convincing evidence that Kim Jong-il's longevity is an issue of concern. The succession so far appears to be going smoothly. However, his designated successor, third son, son Kim Jong-un, will face severe disadvantages because of his lack of experience, his fragile power base, the political constraints on economic reform, and the military's role in politics. In almost all respects, the external and internal conditions are less favorable for this second generation succession than for, than for the first dynastic transfer after the death of regime founder Kim Il-sung in 1994. This could make North Korea an even more dangerous nation, more inclined to engage in further military provocations, to cling to its weapons of mass destruction, and to offer them for sale to any would-be buyer. The Kim family will have to rely heavily on fiscal power exercised by the military and the state security apparatus in order to ensure a successful succession. In pursuit of the goal of becoming a, quote, strong and prosperous great nation, unquote, by next year, such military capabilities are all that the regime can summon. North Korea has enough plutonium for a handful of nuclear weapons. How many weapons worth can only be estimated within a broad range, enough for four to 12 weapons, although most likely fewer than 10. It cannot be said with confidence that North Korea has developed reliable deliverable nuclear weapons. Nevertheless, it will eventually be able to develop a warhead capable of fitting on a ballistic missile with satisfactory re-entry technology especially if it conducts further nuclear tests to refine its weapons design. Pyongyang has made frequent references to using nuclear weapons, which are portrayed as essential to deterring an attack on its own territory. But the weapons largely serve a political purpose. Any actual North Korean offensive use of nuclear weapons would lead to its annihilation. North Korea perceives its nuclear weapons as a way of ensuring its prestige and influence on the international stage and of bolstering the regime's internal legitimacy. The regime no longer refers to the possibility of relinquishing its nuclear assets in return for political and economic concessions. It appears that Pyongyang perceives its nuclear weapons as a permanent feature. The missile program serves a similar political purpose. North Korea has established one of the world's largest ballistic missile arsenals. It has exported such missiles to many countries and conducted provocative tests of longer range systems and space launchers that could be converted into long range missiles. It is very likely, however, that North Korea has historically relied on foreign sources for its supply of Hwasong, Nodong, Musudan, and KN-02 missiles. If unsanctioned supply channels have been shut down or sufficiently attenuated, then North Korea <coughs> will no longer be able to export missiles in large numbers. It would also be unable to expand its missile forces appreciably. Despite Pyongyang's limited indigenous production capabilities, it continues to show considerable interest in developing a satellite launch capability, as well as longer range missiles, possibly including an ICBM. North Korea has the, with the wherewithal to develop these systems if it so decides. Future space launchers and long range missiles will be founded on technologies available to North Korea, primarily legacy engines and components from the former Soviet Union. Although many of these technologies are considered obsolete elsewhere in the world, they can be configured to create the range, payload, envelope that North Korea apparently seeks. Such systems will take time to develop and will require an ambitious flight test program, which should provide the world at least five years of warning before they become combat ready. Moreover, the systems will have limited strategic capabilities for the foreseeable future, will not be fielded in large numbers, and will likely have poor, for, poor performance, accuracy, and reliability. That said, surprises are always possible. North Korean leaders might be willing to accept tremendous risk and deploy a missile before it is fully developed. Prematurely 
fielding missiles such as the Musugan will not provide North Korea with a reliable capability. But if the unproven systems are deployed in ways that can be detected by Pyongyang's adversaries, they may have value for political and deterrence purposes. With the Democratic People's Republic of Korea under more pressure than ever before, the possibility that the regime might begin to unravel cannot be ignored. The Kim regime has long defied predictions of its collapse. It has survived the change of leadership, a catastrophic famine, and the demise of its major sponsor. Yet the crises which now beset North Korea are multiple and acute. The regime may be on the cusp of dramatic change. The current crisis has four aspects. The most obvious concerns the succession. Kim Il-sung prepared his son's rise to power meticulously over three decades. Kim Jong-il, by contrast, was very tardy in anointing a son of his own as heir. The sooner he dies, the less likely that his son's succession will go smoothly. The second crisis is economic. The great leap backwards, as one might call it, of the past 20 years has left the state and most Koreans poorer than they were in 1989 when Soviet aid kept them afloat. Specific tension points include a potential inability to feed even the military. That rash official pledge to create a strong and prosperous nation by 2012 may be bound to haunt the regime. More generally, an impoverished and increasingly disenchanted populace which has become more aware by various means that in South Korea and even China, others live much better, may not put up with such misery and oppression indefinitely. North Korea's third crisis concerns its relations with the outside world. The Kim regime has long played the role of provo provocateur, first to South Korea and laterally to the wider region and world with its nuclear and missile threats. Its efforts were to raise tensions and then angled to be paid to stop. But this approach depends on the willingness of others to play the game, and all interlocutors are tired of it. Such brinkmanship is also risky. The two attacks in South Korea last year make it almost impossible for President Kim Young bok not to strike back hard if Kim Young is rash enough to attack it again. The fourth crisis facing North Korea is more existential. In the context of a divided nation, North Korea has also always falsely portrayed itself as the guardian of Korean nationalism. Today, this lie faces fresh challenges. In practice, the North has surrendered its vaunted Juche philosophy of independence, since it depends crucially on Chinese aid and political support. Meanwhile, for citizens, the myth is wearing thin, given the poverty and oppression of their everyday life. In light of these multiple crises, Korean unification is no longer purely hypothetical. One cannot, of course, rule out a continuation of the status quo. North Korea's collapse has been forecast by many experts for over 20 years. The fact that North Korea is still there, almost a generation after other communist regimes either collapsed or embraced a different economic model, should make anyone cautious about predicting the Kim's demise. On the other hand, the ferment in the Arab world this year is a reminder that no regime lasts forever. We postulate four broad scenarios to unification. The optim optimum one is that over time, North Korea stops doing the things which make it a menace. If the Kims do finally come in from the cold, it could lead to reconciliation and maybe to a peaceful and gradual integration. However, the Kim regime shows no sign of fundamental change. Certain negative behavioral patterns may be hardwired. Even if the regime were to accept a more liberalized economy, it is very unlikely to give up its nuclear weapons. A second positive scenario is German style reunification by absorption and a voluntary or peaceful collapse of the Kim regime. This is also extremely unlikely. So militant and militarized is North Korea that it seems unimaginable for it to crumble peacefully. A third scenario is unification through North Korean collapse the hard way. Unless the Kim regime does a U-turn, it is increasingly likely that North Korea's accumulating contradictions will sooner or later unleash a contingency <coughs> of some kind. 
This would probably be an internal challenge, although any further provocation against South Korea risks provoking strong military retaliation, which could trigger further events or spiral out of control. North Korea's possession of nuclear weapons further complicates an intricate and dangerous situation in the event of a, dis of a disputatious collapse. The nightmare scenario would be a ROK intervention in the North, perhaps including its US ally in an urgent quest for loose nukes, were perceived as hostile by Beijing. It is vital, if politically difficult, that the United States, the Republic of Korea, and China plan trilaterally and discreetly in advance to prevent this. A DPRK collapse with conflict leading the ROK to intervene is similar to a fourth scenario of reunification through war. This is often assumed to be unthinkable. There is little doubt that the South would win such a war. Our chapter on the military balance explains why. But a full-scale conflict in an age of WMD could lay waste to the whole peninsula again for a generation. Yet complacency seems ill-advised. Actions can be misperceived and tensions escalate. For completeness, for completeness, it is also necessary to consider another possible outcome on the peninsula. That North Korea may succeed in maintaining its regime by sheltering under the wing of China. Most unification discourse assumes that South Korea is bound to inherit the North, and I don't disagree. It's important to think through the implications for reunification, however, if China is determined to sustain North Korea as is. China seems to have made a strategic decision that a unified Korea under Seoul leadership and allied to the United States is fundamentally against its interests. Since mid-2010, Chinese policy has moved sharply and visibly to prop up the Kim Jong-il regime and strengthen ties at all levels, from endorsing Kim Jong-un's succession to de facto diplomatic support for the North's acts of aggression. Hence, a plausible alternative scenario for North Korea's future is that it may increasingly become a de facto satellite of China. This is not what Pyongyang would have wanted, but does it have any alternative? If it is a matter of regime survival, the Kims are in no position to resist Chinese patronage. There's no need and no chance that China would in any way formally annex or occupy North Korea. But a client state is another matter. We look forward to seeing what happens. And thank you for your attention. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. So if Mark said he'll take questions um, on any element of uh, North Korea's uh, policy and the security challenges that it may pose. Thanks, Mark. Nice links to, for the record, uh, Director of Transnational Threats and Political Risk here. At the start of your discourse, you mentioned uh, the possession by Pyongyang of chemical and possibly biological weapons. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that a bit. I'm particularly interested in the biological side of things because if one looks elsewhere in the world, Russia being an obvious case in point, one has seen a very clear move away from the development of this capability as WMD towards development of something which is used for very specific targeted uh, um, activities, assassinations, uh, hostage uh, uh, resolution, um, and the like. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Um, we used the word possibly, which uh, was not the word that was used when the first version of this dossier came out in 2004, when there seemed to be more of a collective uh, wisdom that North Korea was uh, definitely pursuing an offensive biological weapons uh, capability. There's been almost no evidence since 2004 that this capability, for which there was a, a body of evidence, um, has been continued or maintained. And a growing um, analysis that it's a very uh, tricky uh, form of WMD to employ because of the uh, possibility of blowback uh, and contagion. So um, we um, 
we just didn't say a whole lot new about biological weapons other than to acknowledge what the South Korean government uh, still assesses that North Korea does have such an offensive weapons capability, but we were not in a position to uh, uh, confirm this. The chemical weapons are more clear. Um, the arsenal is, uh, is still there. It's deteriorated over time. Some of these uh, weapons don't uh, uh, have a long shelf life, but it is still uh, substantial and, uh, and can be used uh, uh, to effect. By the way, I just wanted to say um, uh, a disclaimer that um, I am the editor of the dossier, but um, unlike in some past dossiers, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, write as much of it individually. I edited heavily, but, uh, but the authors, uh, some of whom are in this room, uh, uh, are the um, unheralded uh, uh, heroes of this dossier. Harris, member of the uh, Institute. Uh, there was a great uh, description of the internal dynamics of North Korea. I'm curious how you got your, your, your collaborators got all the information. But my question is more on an external concern. And that is, can you give us a net assessment of the current state of play in North Korea's proliferation of uranium enrichment means to Iran? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we had um, um, partners in this production uh, who are based in South Korea, uh, some of whom have um, um, some um, access to uh, government uh, sources. Um, but we always uh, try to, uh, to balance uh, whatever we got from one country against assessments elsewhere in an intensive peer review is the standard uh, way that WIDLS puts together these dossiers. The, um, um, sometimes um, alleged nuclear cooperation between North Korea and Iran is not something that we were able to confirm. Indeed, um, the evidence um, would indicate that there is not uh, currently such cooperation. And the evidence in this case consists of the uh, display of uranium enrichment equipment uh, um, in uh, Yongbyon was of a different kind of, uh, of centrifuge model than Iran has been employing, uh, including what Iran is uh, now um, moving toward a second generation um, centrifuge model that is different from the one that Sig Hecker saw in North Korea. This would suggest that if there is cooperation, uh, it's, it's an odd form of cooperation that Iran is not able to get the better quality stuff that North Korea has, nor the marriaging steel uh, that North Korea uses as, uh, as the, uh, the hard, hardened uh, steel uh, for its rotors for the centrifuges. Iran uh, is uh, using carbon fiber because it can't uh, acquire or produce uh, marriaging steel. This is not to say that there's not cooperation, but we don't see it yet. And uh, there's certainly a strong reason to continue to be suspicious and to look for it, but we hesitate to uh, reach conclusions that can't be uh, supported. Is Mike in the back yet? Wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joel, Asian Pacific Affairs. Mark, would it be possible for you to throw a bit more light to follow up the particular question just now? A possible military cooperation between North Korea and Myanmar. Is there a possibility of a transfer of a missile technology which people have been talking about for the past 12 months or so? Thank you. Yes, it's interesting that North Korea's um, supply of missiles uh, and missile technology around the world has declined over the past decade as Iran has developed its own production capabilities and apparently surpassed North Korea in some respects. But where uh, North Korea may be finding a new uh, market is in Burma. And the evidence of, uh, of discussions between uh, Burmese military leaders and North Korean military leaders uh, about um, SCUD technology is pretty clear. I don't know whether SCUDs have actually been transferred uh, to Burma, but there obviously have been talks about it. And much of the um, information in the public realm, most of it from defectors, about North Korean uh, visits uh, to Burma, uh, technicians on the ground, um, trade um, company officials on the ground, and shipments to Burma probably are more in the area of conventional arms and possibly missiles, um, not uh, nuclear uh, technology. We don't rule that out at all, but the evidence of any North Korean nuclear cooperation with Burma is 
very thin. There's something going on in Burma regarding nuclear uh, uh, intentions and activity. There's enough evidence of something going on, but the North Korea link is still uh, not something one can pin down. Uh, I'm a stock and China analyst uh, with a local risk management company and member of the institute. Um, my question was, how likely do you actually assess South Korea to uh, retaliate against uh, North Korean provocations? I mean, in, in the past, they've really tried to avoid making any sorts of uh, provocative movements. Um, I know the command structure with the Americans has been changed. What, what uh, is your assessment uh, in light of these uh, recent um, events? Thank you. There's no doubt in our mind that the South Korean um, president, indeed any president of South Korea, will have to respond forcibly to the next provocation. The um, lack of a forceful response last year was deemed uh, domestically uh, to have been a, a, a mistake. Uh, the first uh, time being a form of weakness that uh, was uh, a, uh, a, uh, almost an invitation to a second attack, and that mindset is so strong in South Korea that, you know, both for domestic political reasons and because of the logic of deterrence, South Korea has to respond forcefully uh, to the next provocation. The question will be then, what is North Korea's uh, response when South Korea responds forcefully? Will there be an escalation? Will North Korea believe that it has escalation dominance because it has less to lose in the event of a, a war, it has no stock market or a functioning industry um, to speak of compared with all that South Korea has to lose. Well, North Korea, what they have to lose, of course, is their very regime. And uh, if things spiral out of control, um, they do have to take that into account because they will lose any war. Um, I think I answered the question, you know, what is South Korea's response? They have. Um, in various ways um, signaled that the response will be earned by um, giving the authority to local commanders uh, to respond uh, immediately rather than uh, requiring permission uh, from the capital. The change of the US command, um, uh, operational command, um, has been postponed. That's not uh, really too relevant in terms of South Korea's response uh, today. Um, but it again send, sends a strong signal of South Korea determination and ability and willingness to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin Conroy, NK News and local risk advisory firm. Um, I'm just wondering, yesterday the South Korean Defence Minister said that the possibility of revolution from below was almost impossible. Um, do you agree with that assessment? We didn't, uh, in the dossier, um, assess that question because it, maybe because we didn't think it was, uh, maybe because we didn't think it was possible. But the possibility for um, an internal um, reaction to the regime's oppression, either by a disaffected uh, a set of the population or by um, a set of, of the elite that uh, feel disaffected because of the way the Kim regime relies on its own family. We don't rule out um, some kind of a, a contingency uh, directed from within North Korea. Whether one would call that a revolution from below, um, we don't use those terms. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Aidan Postacata, loosely attached to Leeds University. Uh, Mark, you say that the, the dossier is a, a contribution to public policy debate. And I don't know if IISS is limited uh, in terms of concretely advising things, in which case you won't be able to answer this question. But given that next year both the ROK and the United States will have elections at the end of the year, and South Korea in early 2013 will definitely have a different president, because that's their constitution, and the United States just might, uh, do you think that the, the work you've done in the dossier produces any concrete tips, helpful tips you can give to the situation we've seen so many times when a new government comes in, 
with great ideas what to do about North Korea, or in the case of Barack Obama, seemingly with no ideas at all what to do about North Korea. Um, and it does, does anything follow? Have we been missing something that the AISS has now lit upon? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Aiden. For those who don't know, Aiden Foster Carter is uh, probably the premier of North Korean expert uh, in this country. And uh, Aiden might have had a look at the last couple pages of the dossier, which indeed do uh, look ahead and offer um, some uh, thoughts on um, how to deal with the issue of unification, given that unification is now uh, much more than a theoretical possibility. And uh, the South Korean government has already put in place a number of uh, policies uh, to, uh, to look ahead and plan for unification. Uh, there are other things that uh, a government in South Korea uh, could do, including by taking into account the unification question as it uh, considers uh, other kinds of domestic and indeed foreign policies. A case in point, uh, some years ago, um, South Korea uh, determined to move its capital uh, southward. Um, this uh, didn't eventuate, but, uh, but elements of the administration uh, will be moving uh, southward. If the country is going to be united uh, in our life, if the peninsula is going to be united, um, moving the capital southward might not be the, the best idea. Um, that kind of a decision um, maybe could have had more of a, of a sense of the unification ramifications um, before it was, was made. But as I said, in any case, it's, uh, it's been at least uh, partly rescinded. There are other ways that, um, that uh, unification um, needs to be taken into account, including by um, giving a greater um, sense of, uh, of concern and attention to the growing number of North Korean refugees in the South, now numbering 20,000. Many of them are, are, are not uh, making it in South Korean society, which is a, a very intensely competitive society and of, of people who <coughs> have never had to punch a time card or uh, make decisions on their own having to compete um, in this uh, new society in the South, it's hard for them. There's a lot that the South Korean government is doing to try to assist them, and we enumerate those uh, steps in, in uh, chapter two of the dossier, but uh, there's more that the South Korean people as a whole could do to welcome their North Korean brethren. There, there are some other uh, policy uh, discussions in the book that I, I welcome your attention to. I actually meant more immediate stuff. Like, is it worth restarting the six part of the talk? The, um, you know, I got asked this question when I did a preview of this, uh, this uh, dossier um, at a, a local government department uh, with some foreign um, government people there too. And uh, my answer was that um, the six party talks are, of course, only a means to an end. And uh, whether the six party talks are the most useful vehicle, uh, one might question. There could be other forms of diplomacy um, that might. Uh, might be um, practical and, uh, and even better. But yeah, my recommendation would be that don't give up on diplomacy. Even though it is very unlikely that North Korea will be willing to barter its uh, nuclear weapons or missiles for aid or, or political status, uh, there are other objectives that diplomacy uh, could strive toward. One of these is, is uh, uh, you know, stopping North Korea from exporting uh, its nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction technology. Of course, there are various policies like uh, interdiction that are necessary for this purpose, but, uh, but North Korea might be um, induced to not do that. Um, they might be, um, uh, you know, diplomacy um, can, can be uh, conducive to, uh, to stopping provocations. Now, one doesn't want to get into blackmail, but Victor Cha, uh, who had been in the administration of the George Bush uh, team um, recently uh, came up with a, a very interesting comparison of all the North Korea's military provocations contrasted against the status of, uh, of negotiations. And the two showed that whenever negotiations were going on, North Korea wasn't uh, attacking anyone. Um, so that's another reason why diplomacy uh, uh, has an advantage. Yes. <coughs> Gregory Groves, G3. 
Have we s you, you mentioned I Iran and North Korea being involved in Iran and Yemen. Sorry, North Korea, Iran and uh, Yemen, and Myanmar. Have you seen any, any indication of North Korea being involved in Africa or Latin America? experts that was assembled to assess the implementation of the sanctions on North Korea listed several um, reports that they had received from governments that had interdicted North Korean shipments to other countries. I'm trying to uh, recall off the top of my head whether any of these were to Africa. There weren't any to Latin America. Um, or Eritrea, I think. You're a trade. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, of course, those are only the, no, the, the cases where, where goods got uh, stopped. Given North Korea's uh, long record of seeking to export uh, anything it can, uh, including its uh, military uh, assets, I don't doubt that uh, there have been other exports to Africa and if there were any buyers in Latin America. Um, I don't know if the FARC uh, dossier indicated any examples. Uh, Nigel Shaking said negatively. Uh, that would be you know, one of the possible natural um, uh, markets for North Korea, but uh, they, their reach apparently hasn't extended uh, that far. Yes. Laurie Craig, Minister of Defence. Mark, can you give us any sense of the dynamic within the regime? The particular question I've got in mind is to what extent Kim Jong-un might have um, been behind the provocations last year um, and how much influence he might be having to bear. Well, that's the kind of question we usually turn to uh, government ministries to answer. <laughs> and, uh, we didn't get any... Uh, we didn't get any hints on that. Um, but one thing that can be said is that if you look at the North Korea's history of, of provocations, Kim Jong-il was clearly behind uh, many of the past provocations. So there's no doubt in my mind that the leadership was behind the last year's attacks. Um, there was the uh, reported visit uh, to a, uh, a military facility uh, near uh, the place from which the, uh, the shelling was uh, launched against uh, Yongbyon Island uh, last year, uh, as further evidence of uh, Kim Jong-il's uh, involvement. And Kim Jong-un was with him on that visit. But um, Kim Jong-un uh, today has no uh, uh, positions of authority that make him the one in command uh, for any of uh, Kim Jong-il is still uh, the one, uh, number one, and he hasn't really pushed any of his uh, authority. Kim Jong-un is, is being brought along as the successor. He's, he's the de facto number two. He's been given uh, a certain number of positions, but um, I'm not sure that he is in a position himself alone to, to direct this. I think it would have to have been uh, a father. If there was a son uh, involvement, it would have been a, a father-son. Jonathan Marcus. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Marcus, BBC. Um, take you back to the uh, relationship between North Korea and China, um, which is obviously a, a very difficult one to, to elucidate. And uh, sometimes it's been seen that Beijing might actually act a little bit as a restraint uh, on uh, North Korea. Uh, how worrying then should we see the, the shift that you uh, mentioned uh, late in 2010? Uh, and on the face of it, uh, that sort of shift, that sort of support from Beijing uh, seems more likely to embolden uh, North Korea in, in terms of uh, uh, carrying out future provocations than it does necessarily to, to restrain them. Yes, you put your finger on um, uh, the, uh, the downside of this uh, relationship that um, as long as China is uh, excusing and protecting North Korea, it is probably more likely to engage in that kind of behavior. On the other hand, um, Jonathan, the positive part of this relationship is that uh, China's uh, 
dear desire is that the North Koreans uh, emulate China's uh, market uh, liberalization. Now, that hasn't uh, uh, played out yet. Uh, it, there was an attempt in, in uh, 2002 to do it, but that didn't uh, go very well. But China is still um, trying very hard to persuade um, North Korea to liberalize. And, uh, and maybe there's a more likelihood of that happening. I should say, China, of course, is also trying to persuade North Korea to restrain itself. At the Shangri-La Dialogue in uh, early June, the uh, Minister of, of Defense of China, who was the head of PLA, the Minister of Defense, um, told us that uh, at every level, the Chinese are, uh, are trying to restrain uh, the North Koreans. Uh, and I hope they have uh, more success in the future. Over time, Chinese tutelage and uh, protection uh, may um, provide space for North Korea to evolve in ways that will make unification more possible and less expensive in 20, 30 years in the future. Um, I don't want to make any Pollyannish predictions, but there's both a, a worrisome and potentially um, silver linings in that cloud. Anyone else? Yes. Consulting. My question is, should there be another incident uh, in the future, let's say, the, like the sinking of the children? Uh, as you said, South Korea would be forced to respond. And in that circumstance, uh, there are two possible reactions from North Korea, given that it cannot win a conventional war against the South. One would be to turn to tactical nuclear weapons, and two, to rely on Chinese intervention. In that might mean the, act, uh, the PLA actually coming in and securing South Korea's borders for it. Now, at that time, what do you perceive would be the reaction of the West, particularly the United States, given that it's in a massive debt crisis and it's trying its level best to pull out of all its existing wars? Um, actually, I don't think either of those responses is the most uh, uh, likely one in the case of, uh, of an escalation of tit for tat responses. Um, North Korea, <coughs> I firmly believe, will not use its nuclear weapons um, unless it feels that the country is, uh, is in danger of uh, invasion or uh, overthrow. Um, it would reserve them uh, for that dire circumstance because to use nuclear weapons is to, uh, is to gamble everything and they will absolutely lose that gamble. I mean, they know that the uh, that, uh, United States and, uh, and South Korea have so many uh, means of response um, that the game would be over if they used uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, turning to China, uh, for military uh, help is a possibility in an escalation that gets out of control. If China um, were to um, be alarmed at uh, a, uh, an intervention by uh, South Korea and the United States that was aimed at trying to seize the loose nukes, uh, as in the um, First Korean War, uh, the Chinese might respond by believing that their own uh, nation's uh, security was in peril. And in that circumstance, uh, Chinese in, uh, intervention itself is, is possible, but not in the early uh, rounds. North Korea in the early rounds would be more likely to rely upon its very considerable array of conventional weapons, the, the 300 uh, long-range artillery uh, pieces that are arrayed uh, just north of Seoul, um, could be called into play. Um, Probably not, the, not, not, probably not the second round. Uh, probably they would be more likely to, uh, to attack someplace in South Korea that would uh, be less likely to uh, instigate a full-scale war. That's why North Korea has uh, used the territories in the disputed uh, um, Western uh, Sea, um, known to others as the Yellow Sea. Um, they feel that um, you know, they at least can, can, can point to some reasons why um, that territory, uh, that the northern limit line, has not uh, been uh, declared uh, an international boundary. It's, uh, it was uh, declared unilaterally. You know, they accepted it for years, and they've only uh, more recently uh, contested it. But I think that's probably where North Korea would respond. And you know, they would respond uh, possibly in other ways, using asymmetric capabilities like the uh, computer warfare, internet uh, um, denial of, of, of uh, service and so forth that they are already engaging in against the South. 
Thank you very much. Well, um, let me just commend uh, Mark and all of the many authors and compilers of this uh, dossier for creating such a compelling read, despite the weight of uh, technical information that this uh, book contains. Uh, the ISS has a, a very uh, interesting incentive structure in respect to this book that I'm asked to announce, and that is that if you are members of the press and that you are here today, then do see Tanya Sulem on your way out as you will get a free copy of the dossier, otherwise you'll have to uh, pay £30, and the same applies for uh, members of the Institute. So do consult Tanya Sulem on your way out if you want uh, a copy of this, and of course Mark and his team are available later if you get the press column, and have other questions you might ask.